Good morning, y'all. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tonetta Landis Ina, and I'm the pastor of a church start called Resurrection City, DC. It's been a joy for me to get to know Justin and the leaders of this community over the past two years. So when Justin invited me to preach, I absolutely couldn't turn down the opportunity. It's been a privilege to watch you all as a church do hard things over the past year, things that most churches and most church leaders would shy away from. So even as I preach this morning, I pray that a little bit of the humility and wisdom of Christ City Church rubs off on me. But I also have to say that Justin will owe me after this sermon. When he asked me months ago to be with you, he explained to me the sermon series in an email. Out of the nine Beatitudes, I asked him if I could preach on the one in Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. What I didn't realize and what I still think was typed in a slightly smaller font than the rest of the email was that the Beatitude was scheduled for the Sunday before one of the most contentious elections in our lifetimes. He somehow failed to mention that. So if all of a sudden you see me out in the city with a haircut, like Mr. Justin Fung's, you will know I have called in my favor and in the process, defy the principles of biology. All right, y'all, seriously though, the Beatitudes are as hard as they are beautiful. They're profound, but they also cause us to bottom out our own resources in the recognition that we can't quite be that kind of disciple at least not on our own. Now, before I say anything else, I want us to stop for a minute in order to orient our hearts to these teachings one more time so that we fully take in how revolutionary they are. I'm going to read them aloud. Feel free to close your eyes as I do or to center down in whatever way feels most comfortable to you. No matter what is happening in your home or in your heart right now, try to hear these sayings deeply. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Now, there's a lot to take in from these verses, a lot to consider, a lot to be shaped by. Teachings like these interrupt us. They lift our eyes to a future world, but also call us to prophesy to that future world right here and right now in our bodies. And verse seven is probably the hardest for me. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. See, as a little girl growing up in the South, I was taught to be a good girl. I was taught to be seen and not heard. I was taught to hold my tongue when someone spoke to me a little bit inappropriately. In my home and in my community, I was rewarded for being humble, forgiving, patient, and merciful to a fault. 
Absorbing the wrongs of other people with grace and eloquence was something I became known for, even as a young adult. Years before Michelle Obama stood under the national spotlight and said, when they go low, we go high, that sentiment had already become my model. Although I never would have acknowledged it, I prided myself on being gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love as if I were God. But I clearly am not God. And somewhere in my 30s, the bottom fell out for me on that way of living. I am a queer, black, gender non-conforming woman. So maybe it was bound to happen. Maybe the first step was being pushed out of one of the theologically conservative churches I had been a part of for years because I was queer. It became obvious that the very evangelical tradition that had taught me to be merciful hadn't been very merciful to me. Or maybe it was the murder of Trayvon Martin in 2012 which seemed to usher in an age of renewed clarity around the white supremacy culture in this country that has never shown any mercy. I was fortunate enough not to grow up with any illusions that the kingdom of God was the American dream. Fortunate enough to be taught early by my parents that America was a racist place and would be so for a very, very long time. Yet that still didn't prepare me for the brazenness of a criminal justice system that rarely shows mercy to black and brown people. It didn't prepare me for this summer, for the day I was cooking in the kitchen and I saw too late that the video showing the last few minutes of George Floyd's life had come on. I couldn't, I couldn't get to my three-year-old in time to prevent him from seeing his first public lynching, the brutal murder of a black man with skin not too different from his own. In light of all these things, the call to mercy is hard for me. Maybe it's become hard for you too. I would far rather take refuge in the language and lifestyle of justice than to go anywhere near the rhythms of mercy. I would far rather talk to you about the disturbing images of psalms which come out of the mouths of oppressed people longing for justice. I would far rather talk to you about the confusing images of revelations which usher from a persecuted church who just needs to imagine not being on the bottom for once. I would far rather talk to you about the Syrophoenician woman who uses sass to challenge Jesus and is rewarded by Jesus for that sassy reply. For saying that, Jesus said, this woman's daughter would be healed. To be clear, there is absolutely, absolutely a need for oppressed people to reclaim the biblical language of justice. There is absolutely a need for more and more movements of justice that are initiated and supported by the church. Still, texts like this one draw us beyond ourselves. The desire for justice, even if limited to personal vindication, comes fairly naturally to us. The desire to show mercy comes from somewhere else entirely because there is little obvious for us to gain in it. So let's look a bit more closely at Matthew's take on mercy. Jesus delivers these teachings from a mountaintop to a people under the crush of the Roman Empire. Just before he begins to preach the verses prior to this, let us know that the proclamation and healing of Jesus had aroused enough interest that people from all over were bringing those in need to him. His healing was in many ways an indictment of an empire that claimed to provide health and wealth to its people. In the community that forms around Jesus, it is clear that the gospel of empire has failed. 
And these are folks who carry in their bodies the results of that failure. Jesus engages them apart from any profession of faith. He demonstrates mercy in the midst of merciless empire. Then Jesus goes up onto the mountain. Place is critical in this story and the place from which he delivers this sermon conjures up connections to Mount Zion, the place from which the rule of God is established in the Hebrew Bible. For these folks who have never received mercy, Jesus sketches a vision of a future world in which reversal will be the order of the day. In that way, these teachings are not yet. Still, the mountain from which Jesus delivers this sermon also recalls Mount Sinai, the place at which Moses is given the Torah. So the teachings, while having a strong not yet quality, also provide a vision which the alternative community of Jesus is called to now. For folks on the margins of empire, this vision makes clear that in the words of one of my favorite singers, Bernice Johnson Reagan, there's a new world coming. Everything's going to be turning over. But it also makes clear that the disciples of Jesus are called to mirror that future vision now, that future vision of a new world. And that includes showing mercy, whether we receive it in return or not. To be merciful, see, is to be actively compassionate, particularly in relation to need. Mercy for Matthew is not an attitude. It's not about the thoughts we think or about something we feel. It's about what we actually do. And Matthew seems to care a lot about this kind of mercy. In the very first chapter of the book of Matthew, mercy comes up in a profound, life-saving way. When Mary turns up pregnant before she is married, the text says that Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. Because Joseph is righteous, he is merciful. Right out of the gate, Matthew demonstrates that right living, even as oriented toward justice, includes the practice of mercy in ways that are scandalous. But it's, it's two other stories about mercy in Matthew's gospel that I, that I think should also rock us to the core at an even deeper level. They add depth and complexity to the beatitude about mercy and they demonstrate what I think is critical about the call of Jesus to a life of mercy. These stories demonstrate that mercy is one of the most difficult things to practice precisely because it touches our desire for purity and our deep resistance to recognizing our vulnerability. Said another way, Jesus calls us to come out of our desire for purity and out of our illusions of self-sufficiency by his insistence that his disciples practice mercy. We see the first part of this in Matthew 9, chapters 9 through 13. Feel free to check this out later in the week uh, if you have a moment. This is the famous story in which Jesus invites Matthew, the tax collector, to become a disciple. And then Jesus goes home with him to dine with others considered tax collectors and sinners. The Pharisees, a religious sect of the day, take note of this and challenge Jesus' intimacy with people who are such untouchable examples of piety. The story ends with Jesus exhorting the Pharisees to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy not sacrifice. For I have come to call the, the, the righteous, to call not the righteous, but sinners. Jesus lifts up Hosea 6.6, 6, a verse which centers mercy over ritual. In the context of claims that he has become intimate with the wrong types of people, 
Now, what's interesting here is that when this gospel was written, the temple, the center of sacrifice, had likely already been destroyed. Sacrifice, as Hosea understood it, likely no longer would have been in play. Yet the writer still grounds the call of Jesus to mercy in this sentiment. Why? Because I think the writer understands Jesus' call of mercy as an attack overall on what Richard Beck calls the purity impulse and not just on actual sacrifice. The call of, of Jesus to be merciful touches our desire to be pure and to be considered pure, to be uncontaminated, to expel from our midst all of those who don't fit our standards. The call of Jesus to mercy directly contrasts our desires to erect barriers and to scapegoat. Y'all, as I've already said, we are in the middle of what may go down as a most contentious election of our times. For many of us, these next few days will be filled with anxiety and anger. Yet I challenge you to hear the summons of Jesus even as you try to take care of yourselves in the next few days. Go and learn what this means. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not, not sacrifice. I desire hospitality to the other and not the perception that you have held the line. I desire practical acts of compassion and not the rhetoric that lays our collective sins on the backs of others until we are absolved and they are banished outside the city walls. Again, I don't say this lightly. I myself have real fears that in the next years, my marriage to the woman I love most in the world could be invalidated. Real fears that I could lose my parental rights to my son nationally because he did not come out of my body and because I am queer. Yet, I am convinced that the call to go and learn the way of mercy still leads to life. Mercy is one of the most difficult things to practice, not only because it challenges our desires for purity, but also because it touches our deep resistance to recognizing our vulnerability. So I wanna share another story. This one comes from Matthew 12, one through 14. And in this story, we can again see Jesus lift up the line from Hosea 6.6. 6. This time, Jesus phrases it a little bit differently. He says, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. The context for this admonition is a series of disputes with the Pharisees about Sabbath observance. The disciples of Jesus pick heads of grain, technically fitting the definition of harvesting, and they eat them on the Sabbath because they are hungry. The Pharisees call Jesus out on letting his disciples break the Sabbath in this way. Not long after, Jesus encounters a man with a withered hand in the synagogue and the Pharisees try to trap Jesus by asking whether it is lawful for the man to be healed on the Sabbath. Jesus then lays out an economic illustration for them. He explains that if they owned a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, then they would rescue the sheep, even though this would be questionable to do on the Sabbath. The implication is that they would do it because the animal is a part of their livelihood and they have to eat. The key to both of these stories in Matthew 12, to both of these moments when the Pharisees fail to practice mercy is their lack of awareness of their own need. That is what Jesus addresses the Pharisees, in their focus on ritual purity, become blind to their own needs. Because they feel themselves invulnerable, because they are not in touch with their own need, they cannot practice mercy. Richard Beck again, here's how he puts it in his book, Unclean. 
The flight into purity is often a flight from need into self-sufficiency. And this flight has catastrophic effects upon human compassion and empathy. A person who can let go of artificial standards of purity can become a person of mercy. And a person who knows their own need, their own vulnerability, their own brokenness is well on the way down the path of mercy. Now, I'm aware as I end that I've just barely touched on this great beatitude. There are so many stories to share and so much more that that could be said about mercy. Yet I want to be clear that Jesus' vision of mercy gives me hope, not because it feels more appealing than justice and not because we can practice it in our own effort. Letting go of our standards of purity and being honest about our own need are both extremely hard. No, this, this vision gives me hope because it is so clearly to exchange our own images of ourselves as God's pure and self-sufficient for a truer vision of the God who chooses to be revealed as merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. A truer vision of the God who took on human flesh and became vulnerable on the cross. May our lives be resounding yeses to that vision as we find ways to follow the difficult path of mercy. Amen. And thank you, Christ City.